I made some progress on the rebuild of 234 offline, but I'll get you caught up on that as we continue the video series. I, dis I uh, removed the body uh, by disabling four screws underneath the chassis, and this is pretty much the same uh, across all GP7s. There'll be a screw on each end, which is much more accessible if the trucks and knuckle and coupler assemblies are removed. And then there's two screws underneath this particular back axle on the motor side, right there and right there. So once those are disabled, you should be able to lift the body off. Now, the only challenge I've had in lifting these bodies off of these GP7s is sometimes the body seems to want to stick to the plastic or the metal. Uh, you have to be careful. I wouldn't do, I wouldn't remove it by brute force. Uh, I would take, what I've done is taken a number 11 exacto knife and just pried it up underneath it gently until I can locate the point in which most of the uh, adhesion is taking place and then concentrate on that very softly, very easy uh, to remove it. Uh, one side note, uh, once the body's removed or at any time on these trains, uh, I would not handle it by these handrails. Uh, I've had these come off before and that's not fun to get them back on. This one is bent slightly to the back as though it may have been bent in a collision or a drop, but I'm not gonna try to shape it up and bend it back to where it's standing up because that is just asking for trouble. And two things, the paint chipping off more and it coming uh, undone from its rivets that holds it onto the body. So if the owner's okay with it, I would just leave it alone. Now, in removing the body, I went ahead and gave it a cold wash to remove some of the lint and dirt and dust. And you can see where dust has discolored the paint just a little bit around this stack. Dust have a capability of doing that, drying things out. So I gave it simply a cold wash, cold water, with a camel hair brush and got the dirt and dust out of these vents. Uh, it was pretty much everywhere on this train where there's a point of relief. Point of relief being these little lines right up here on these side doors along the long hood, even the point of relief on these uh, road numbers, everything. And I even washed the windows inside and out. So I think it looks pretty doggone good. One of the ways to kind of make the paint look better on these sometimes is simply use uh, your hands, the oil just on your hands, not oils off of something that you've touched that's on your hands, but just the natural oil on your hands, and maybe just rub it just a little bit. A friend of mine used to call it uh, nose grease uh, because fly fishermen, I understand, would take their flies apart and then they would take the brass tip on those uh, poles and rub it right in the crease on their nose get a little nose grease on them and uh, put the poles back together. Keeps them from sticking. But anyway, gave it a cold wash and then if the owners had cho chose to do so, just rubbing it with your hands over time could get a little bit even deeper coloration, although it looks doggone good uh, right now. Once I removed the body, I found a 432 bub in the front. That's non-standard. And I found a 1447 in the back. I'll replace the 432 large globe with a standard 1447 when I return the train to the owner. We're going to start at the back of the locomotive, get that in condition first. The reverse unit is easy to remove. It's got two screws on either side near its base, here and here. And once I take those out, I'll be able to lift up on the reverse unit, maybe sit it right in this area here. Gives me uh, more space to drop the front truck out uh, to work on it, but we'll do that later. But right now what I'm gonna do first, in the first phase, is work on everything from this point going back. This, of course, is the bell and the bracket for the manual bell. In front of that, or behind that, is the truck. And the truck, uh, has got some problems. It was really binding to the chassis, which means its, liter its lateral movement was really uh, difficult, and it was binding. It was even a challenge little challenging to do by hand, 
to get it to twist and that's never good. Uh, these need to go, when they go around the curves and the switches, these need to move quite naturally and quite easily. Uh, same thing on its rocking ability, rocking back and forth. You can't even hardly move this one by hand, yet it should rock naturally back and forth uh, for, say, changes in grade and things like that, which could impact the train. So it really needs to be washed thoroughly and then degreased and then re-oiled. So uh, as far as the nomenclature, again, the bell in the bracket, the spring and bracket assembly is here. This is the spring that has the bell clapper or hammer on it. And its bracket is right here at its base. If you've never seen one of these, kind of a clever uh, arrangement, but uh, tedious to maintain. Then it's got a pin right here upon which the bell and its bracket uh, rotate around. And then it's got a tension spring right here to hold the tension on it. See the tension spring in the back and the pin, the spring and bracket assembly. And all this thing does is the axle rotates and it has on it a small cam. And that cam is placed on the axle. It's actually a geared axle type. And they put the cam right where the gear would have been. And so as, it ro as the train rolls, that cam strikes the plate on the base of the spring and bracket assembly, causing the hammer to move forward briefly, but spring back into place. So that's the movement there you see is how it gets the ding, 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 ding uh, of the plane. Of course, the slower, uh, the probably the steadier it'll go. Of course, and when it gets up to speed, Theoretically, the two cams that are on the axle flip this thing so rapidly that the hammer never has a chance to go forward and ring the bell. That's why when you speed it up, it shouldn't ring when you slow it down. It does. So that's the retaining spring. Now, I have taken these out before during the rebuild, but they are really tedious to get back in. And I think I'm going to be an elect on this one to be as gentle as I can on the washing and the degreasing and leave the spring in place. What else we have on this one is a recent, just a minute ago explained, is that we had very, very limited lateral movement. It was obvious this thing needed to be cleaned. And you can see the oil and grease where the washers were. That's not a ring, that's oil and grease. And what I did was to drop this out, I removed an E-clip that was right on top of it. Pretty easy to put out. Uh, they're not too terribly difficult to put on, especially if, if you have tiny needle nose pliers. And when I pull that out, what goes on the bottom is another washer. And what goes on the top is another washer and some sort of retaining washer. And then the E-clip goes on top of it. But it was really essential. I wasn't too thrilled about having to drop that truck off. If it had had good lateral movement and good rocking movement like this, I probably would have just cleaned it in place and re-lubricated it. But it didn't. It really needs to have the old lubrication removed.